Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Leslie McGee with the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center. Welcome to today's presentation, the APS workload tool being presented by Carl Urban from the APS Start. Before we get started, I want to address a few housekeeping items. NAMERS and the APS TARC are a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services. The models and information provided during this webinar do not serve as official guidance to comply with any part of the APS final rule. All information provided is done so for informational purposes only. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC. We work with states to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by supporting federal, state, and local partners' use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies, and providing APS programs with individualized technical assistance. We're here to help APS programs in any way that we can. Please just reach out to us using the contact information that will be displayed at the end of the webinar. Please use your computer speakers to access audio for this webinar and make sure the speaker volume is adjusted to your desired level. If you experience audio problems due to internet connection speeds or hardware issues, we recommend exiting the webinar and re-entering. Everyone is muted for this webinar. You may ask questions of Carl at any time by typing them into the questions box. We will relay as many as we can to him when we pause for questions. All attendees will receive an automatically generated email approximately 24 hours after the webinar ends with a link to your certificate of attendance. This webinar is being recorded and all registrants will receive an email when the recording is made available on the APS TARC YouTube channel. Slides and handouts for this presentation will be available when the webinar recording is posted online. Now I'm going to run a quick poll to see who our audience is and um, just please select by touching your screen the profession with which you most identify. We're going to give everyone a few minutes to uh, make their selections and I will show the results when we are done. Hmm. Okay, now I'm starting to see some votes. We're going to give this just a few more seconds because we're almost there with our audience. Okay, it looks like just about everybody who plans to respond is, has done so. And I'm going to share that. As we expected about the majority of our audience is uh, from APS. So I'm going to go ahead now and turn this back over to our presenter, Carl Urban. And thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Leslie. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I am Carl Urban. I'm a senior research manager with the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center. Sorry about, that. about me. Uh, next slide. Uh, so on that graphic you saw earlier about the mission of the APS TARC, you had the different work streams. One of those work streams is research and innovation. This slide provides the text that kind of provides us our direction from ACL. Um, to do this. We're, we're to be working on identifying new and emerging issues and research affecting APS practice. Um, we sat down with ACL a couple of years ago and talked about various topics that we thought we needed to look into to work on to in this particular area and we decided on the issue of caseload and workload within the context of trying to identify new and emerging issues. Um, and so next slide, please. So this webinar is kind of the conclusion of our work on the issue.
issue. We've been working on it um, for a couple of years. And so what we want to do today is to provide you with an introduction and an overview of the new APS workload tool and toolkit. Uh, we'll give you a little bit of background. We'll give you an overview of the tool and the toolkit. your workload, uh, and then we'll have some discussion at the end. I think I want to emphasize a couple of things here about today's webinar. One, probably going to go a little fast um, as we go through this, uh, and by that I am emphasizing this is the introduction and the overview of this particular tool. I am trying to whet your appetite. I am not going to be in an hour telling you exactly how to use it. Ideally, the tool and the toolkit itself uh, will be self-explanatory enough um, that, that you really don't need a webinar to explain how to use it. But as I will emphasize at the end again, we will be available for providing technical assistance to do it. So this is introduction and overview. We're going to try to be comprehensive in what we cover, but we are not going to get into the details of everything um, that's involved in this. So as I go pretty quickly through this, I encourage you to use the question box to type your questions and we will answer as many of them as we can at the end. Um, we have, are planning to do the same workshop at the NAPSA conference in more or less the same format, more or less the same detail, but we will have an hour and a half there. So if we don't get to stuff today, hopefully we can get to some of it um, at the end. Normally with our webinars, we have the slides available for you. They are not available for you because we do not have final ACL approval of the tool and toolkit. So the language, I mean, these slides come directly out of the toolkit and the tool. So until we get final ACL approval on, on the language, some of those things, we are not going to be making them available, but hopefully we'll have that by the time we get this webinar posted. Uh, so that is what we are doing today. Let me first talk a little bit about project background. You have heard this from us before, but I just want to hit a couple of highlights on that. Uh, so next slide, um, and this is kind of the genesis of where this came from in part. Uh, when ACL did a research agenda for APS a few years ago, um, you know, the the top two priorities in that were we need to understand the impact of caseload on APS outcomes and on APS clients. And then the agenda explained why in the words that you see here, important element of working conditions, negative consequences for workers' performance, client safety and well-being, life depend on having an effective APS response, and too, too much work for the number of workers you've got you will not achieve those outcomes. And so from both the research agenda and anecdotally, we heard from the APS programs how important of an issue this was. So next slide, please. Uh, but as we started on the project, one thing became very clear to us, uh, and that is that we really need to go beyond the concept of caseload to the concept of workload if we're really going to do justice to the issue and really try to provide a way to help APS programs out. Uh, you know, there was this clamor, tell me, a caseload standard for APS, and there is no standard for APS caseload in this tool. I'm just telling you that right up front because such a thing is really kind of not possible in some ways. Instead, what became clear to us from talking to the programs and to talking to some experts is that we really kind of need to focus on the broader concept of workload. Whereas caseload is math, it's a ratio of cases to staff members. Uh, workload is a broader construct in thinking about how much time it takes for a caseworker to do the work that's required in each case and as well as, as was pointed out to the programs as we were talking about it, work, caseworkers do a lot more than just uh, investigate cases. There's training and all the other administrative kinds of responsibilities that they have as well. So this is focused on workload, not caseload. Why does it matter? Next slide, please. Uh, this is kind of 101 stuff. It's just worth reiterating. 
you know, workload matters because you've got to do your resource planning. We're going to talk about projecting the number of needed FTEs. Uh, budget folks really need that. Agency management needs that. Your legislative leadership, governor's office, everybody needs it for resource planning purposes. The second thing is if you're going to plan your program, uh, you need to know this information. Um, you want to avoid backlogs, you want to be able to address them when they occur, most importantly, you want to prevent them from occurring. And so the, con the concept here is to use data to improve your program performance. If you do those things, hopefully what we really ultimately want to get to is improved outcomes for clients, for workers, and for our community partners. So understanding workload really matters to achieving good positive outcomes in the world of APS. Next slide, please. So we, as we started on this, it, it became clear that there were some basic assumptions that undergirded um, this work. The first thing was that nobody had ever done it before. Nobody had ever really looked at caseload workload needs except for one study uh, that NAPSA had done back in the past. Uh, and they, they came up with a caseload standard there, but it, it, um, it didn't really work for our purposes. Uh, and so there'd really not been a systematic study of it. Uh, as we were talking to the programs, as we were looking at the literature, there are many, many variables. And we're going to talk about many variables today that impact caseload and workload. Uh, it's the proverbial multifactorial kind of thing. It's just not simplistic, and that's just the way it is. Uh, we just have to deal with the complexity here. Um, uh, we can't establish national standards for this. APS programs are too difficult. Uh, understanding what is an optimal level is probably a program-specific thing that you need to do in your APS programs. Hopefully, we are giving you the tools to be able to do that. Um, and then the final thing is linking of caseloads to outcomes is difficult. Not because we don't understand caseloads so much, but because it's hard and difficult to measure and quantify client outcomes. Um, in our final report to ACL, I'm not going to cover it today, we do have some suggested studies that we think could be done to try to take a closer look at this link between caseload and outcomes. Uh, next slide, please. So project goals, you all heard me discuss this before. Uh, the overall goal is to figure out a framework and tools. Oh, where did we go? Um, could you go back a slide, Leslie? There we go, project goals. Uh, we wanted to, to establish a framework and tools. And so we're going to go through that tool and that framework for understanding APS workload today. And we're going to talk about that larger context, that complexity that, that exists for those. The way we did this was in a two-year process. Last year, we did a needs assessment uh, to identify the most important factors and, and to look specifically at some programs that we thought did a very good job of looking at this already and determine what was consistent across those programs. And so this year, our work was to figure out how to translate that into an actual framework tool and promising practices for programs to use. And that's what we're going to be communicating um, today. So very briefly, next slide. Uh, we did this needs assessment last year. Um, and we we started off by looking at the literature on this, which I have mentioned is not much, and you can go back to our past webinar on this if you really want to dive into some of the detail on that or look at our final report. We got a lot of field input. Uh, we talked to field staff in Ohio and Texas. Uh, we did the national listening session. We did in-depth interviews with a number of programs. Both I will emphasize at the county and at the state level. I recognize that there are a bunch of county APS staff on this webinar um, and not just state staff. And so I would say this tool that we're talking about today works at different organizational levels. It's not designed only for a state APS level. You can use it at a county level as well. County programs had input directly into this process as we did this, and then our process now in the final box there is to discuss the findings and communicate this to you 
um, as we go forward. So next slide, please. So what did we discover from the, from the needs assessment? And again, I have been through some of this before, but I think it's important to set the context for, as we look at the tool in more detail. Um, and I think just the number of people that are on this webinar today suggests that uh, this is a real issue for states. Uh, we we kind of thought that going in, and I think it has been affirmed as we have gone through this process. And part of that is because from what we can tell, most states have not set up systems to measure and manage their workload. Hopefully this tool is gonna give them a process and, and a way to be able to do that. Um, another thing that we discovered early on is, is that APS programs really don't know or understand the amount of work that is required in a case. A few programs have done workload studies. Uh, they tend to be old and they sometimes tend to not be very helpful. So one of the things that in the end we wanted to do with this tool, and they, we asked ACL about this and they said yes, is we want to try to give you something to help you uh, better understand the amount of work that is required in the case. And so that'll be the first aspect of the tool that we will look at. Um, the third thing, which I've already touched on a little bit, is that caseload is really a critical concept in understanding uh, how to manage your workload. But it's the, it's the proverbial necessary but not sufficient concept for really understanding what is going on with workload. It just doesn't tell you enough by itself. And I'll make this point probably a couple of times, caseload is just one metric and it can be manipulated. Uh, so you really don't want to look at it alone. As we talk to the field staff, particularly about this, in the end, a lot of this is an issue of staff capacity. How do we empower our staff to be as efficient and as effective as possible? And so as we go through this today, we will talk about a number of different things that impact the ability of staff to get work done. Uh, part of that is depending upon what the, what the common policies and practices are that support your ability to do workload management. We'll talk specifically about some of those key policies and practices. And then as we did the needs assessment, we identified four different types of workload models and the metrics that are associated with them that are used in APS programs. Out of that, we developed synthesis that we have put into our toolkit today. So that's what we did. That's how we got here. That's what we think we've learned. And so what did we actually learn? Next slide, please. Um, with a great deal of help, uh, we tried to put it together in one page, kind of a model for trying to understand what is going on with APS workload. I actually think Zach Kasimis from USC sketched out the very first version of this uh, for us in one of our team meetings. Um, a, a few things to emphasize about this. Um, the first thing is, as I have already said, this is very much multifactorial. Uh, there are lots of interrelated factors that impact APS workload. Um, when you're thinking about APS workload, what you're trying to do is achieve some sort of balance between the availability of resources and the need for resources, and that impacts your workload. Metrics matter much when it comes to this particular topic. And so you see in those bottom four purple boxes there, a number of metrics that are outlined and we will talk about some of the detail on those metrics as we go through this today. And then the final thing in that upper box is those contextual moderators as we call them, uh, nice academic term that, <laughs> that uh, Zach used. Uh, this summarize, this box just summarizes a lot of factors that impact the availability of resources and that impact the need for resources. When you put all of that together, it all comes together and it impacts your workload. You want to have an ideal workload for your staff because it impacts the outcomes both for the client and for your staff. You need to have uh, staff that have 
good morale that are not overburdened uh, because that's part of the process here with workload management is, is you need that you need that place of, of relative happiness if you will with your staff so that they are doing a good job in terms of the impacts on the clients so next slide please all right so let's dive into this in a little a bit of details um all right so you're we're, you're going to see a bunch of tables in the subsequent slides going through a number of these factors um, and I am not going to touch on all of the different elements of these tables, uh, but you can kind of see how we have explained these things in the workload tool. We try to we try to deal with all of the variables. We try to define what they are. We try to explain um, what they why they matter um, as you go through these things. So again, I'm not going to touch on all of the detail in these as we go through this today. Um, and I want to start with things that are external factors that have, that affect the amount of work and the time to conduct casework. So these are things that programs have little control over. Um, who the program serves, how difficult the cases are, what resources you have are often beyond your control. I mean, you might be able to change the definition of who is eligible in your population, but even that has become a little bit more difficult with the, with the APS rule. I know we went through a process to do that in Texas, and it was a very stakeholder driven, and that's just, it is, it's just difficult to control the things that you see on this uh, particular table. All these things impact the ability um, and the time that's necessary to conduct casework. Next slide, please. So these are factors that impact worker capacity. You heard me talking about worker um, capacity earlier. And these are things that programs actually have a lot more direct control over. And I think most of these things are um, probably self-evident. Recruitment and retention, training, um, are things that directly impact how much work a worker does, how efficiently they do their work. But I wouldn't, and the tools that they have, do they have the technology to really empower them to be able to do casework efficiently? Um, maybe the other three are not quite as self-evident. Mission and culture are, are really important in terms of worker job satisfaction. Um, supervisors are critical. Uh, for empowering and enabling and teaching workers to be able to work efficiently. And then the question is, do you, does your agency, does your program have some sort of quality assurance process that provides the feedback that's necessary to make improvements um, in what you are doing? All these things impact worker capacity. Uh, next table, key policy and practice factors that impact workload. Um, programs have control over their policy and practice to some extent. Uh, you may have to follow legislative directives. They're going to have to be consistent with federal rules, but, but you have some control over the way these things um, get implemented. And so these are some of the key decisions that you have to make uh, in terms of the responsibilities and requirements. Who is responsible for what? What are the time frames that things need to be done in? Do you have specialized staff to take the workload off of workers uh, for some routine tasks? Have you standardized processes to such an extent that they can be done efficiently? Um, all of these key policy practice factors impact the amount of time and how efficiently you are able to do your casework. So next slide, please. So those are sort of, at a very high, quick level, all of the factors that impact um, workload. When we, when we got around to developing our workload model, we ended up thinking about three different objectives in terms of the type of information that we wanted to provide to programs to help them. Um, 
The first one, as I explained earlier, was this question of understanding workflow. How much time does it take to do a case? What types of things do I need to think about um, in understanding APS casework and APS case flow? The second question was sort of the one we started with, which is how do I project the number of needed FTEs in my program? And then the third question is, okay, I know how many FTEs I need, but I have still got to manage this program on a day-to-day -day basis. How do I manage my workload in such a way that it is done as efficiently as possible? And so our workload model addresses all three of these. And so I want to talk about each of these in turn. So let's start with understanding uh, workflow. And this next slide has a, an overview of this. So what we were trying to do is to provide a beginning framework to understand the steps in your workflow process. And I'll show you what we mean by workflow process in just a minute. Um, this is sort of the foundation for understanding the projections that you need to do um, in projecting your staffing needs. Time is a big consideration here. Durations are a big consideration here. If you don't understand what work goes into a case, then it's difficult to really understand what your staffing needs are. Um, there are some key considerations here. Every APS program is different. And so this is a beginning framework. I mean, that word is chosen carefully. Uh, you need to add to and take away from this as is appropriate to your particular program. Um, this workflow may need to be different for different types of cases. Your policy and your practice for self-neglect may be a little bit different than it is for a perp-driven case that has more due process considerations because there's a potential registry on the back end of it. Um, you'll have to make those decisions on your own. Uh, and the last thing I'd say about this workflow process is it's, it's one of those things where hopefully if you do it, you'll get as much benefit out of the process of doing as process of doing it, the dialogue that you'll have, the relationships you'll establish as you're talking about it, as you will from whatever product that you generate from it. So what does this look like? Um, next slide. This is a screenshot of, of what it looks like. And so to explain what we did with our workload tool, we created an Excel spreadsheet. In the Excel spreadsheet, there's an individual tab, one for workflow, one for projection, and one for management. Uh, and so this is a screenshot of the, of the workflow process. And so in the first column there, you can see a number of activities that are listed, and then you see a number of questions in the subsequent columns. So who does the activity? What's the result? When does it have to be done by? And so on. So next slide shows the specific um, activities that we had listed. A number of you are aware that we created a logic model when we were doing the APS evaluation. In that logic model, we had defined kind of a typical APS case flow. Um, with the number of activities that we think are common to APS cases. That said, we know that policy and practice vary from state to state, perhaps even from county to county. So you're going to need to modify um, this as needed. But I think as you look through all of these steps here, you'll see and understand um, how they describe what typically happens in an APS uh, case, beginning an intake all the way through to the quality assurance process. And I would emphasize again here, you may have to do this differently for different types of cases. Next slide, please. And so, you know, you saw there were five questions that we wanted to ask about all of these steps. Uh, and this provides the definition or the description or the questions that you want to ask for all of these. And so just to take the first one, who does the activity? Who is assigned responsibility for the activity? Who does intake? Who does initial case initiation? Typically, it's all going to be the same worker, but it may vary from program to program. So you need to ask the question, um, who, is, who is doing this? Uh, and we provide an example of, of who it could be in all of these. Um, I, I would jump to the how is it completed column 
one of the potential benefits of this workload tool is you can describe your workflow process as is or you can also use this tool to just think about okay this is as is but how should it be and i will credit reza from oklahoma from making this point to me is that you need to think not only about as is but if you're going to manage and improve your workload you need to think about how it should be Anyway, as, as you work through these five questions, I think it will help you come to a much better understanding of um, your workflow. Understanding your workflow is necessary for projecting the number of staff that you need and to helping you manage the workflow down the road. Next slide, please. So then the second big objective of this was to, un was to be able to project the number of needed FTEs. And so what we were trying to do here is to provide a rational, a rational method based on data for consistently determining and justifying staffing needs. And so we we looked at you know half a dozen programs and how they were doing this, the methods that they were using to do this. Um, and I will give a shout out here uh, to the people at evident change um, who have been doing this type of work in the world of CPS as well. Um, they sent us some of their materials and we sat down and had a conversation with them um, about how they were doing it in the world of CPS and it was very helpful and very affirming um, to us as we were doing our considerations of okay what are the factors that we need to look at in projecting the number of needed FTEs. So the outcome for this particular objective is that we provide the metrics and the instructions for estimating the number of needed FTEs for an APS program. There are a number of considerations. Um, you might need to do this projection for different types of staff. Your intake staff may be different than your investigation staff. Your service delivery staff may be different than your investigation staff. I don't know. You have to figure that out um, for your individual program. But I think the categories that we have that I'll show you in just a second work for all of those different types of uh, frontline staff. Second thing is caseload is something that is a consequence um, in this. And so, you know, you want to think about caseload, but caseload is not driving this um, as, as you look at this. You can increase or decrease the caseload per worker um, and, and you really, as you're thinking about caseload, have to think about the number of hours per investigation. Time ends up being a critical factor in this. In fact, that's the, that's the one issue you're probably going to struggle with in this, which again is part of why we gave you a workload workflow tool Figuring out how much time you spend, how much time you should be spending um, to do certain tasks is a critical part of this. Um, and we have some suggestions on ways um, to do that. Um, you want to monitor and you want to manage to these metrics. Um, and if you do that, hopefully you can over time improve your caseloads and improve your overall workload. Next slide, please. So here are some of the, in the, in the following charts are some of the key variables that are needed to project the number of needed caseworkers. Um, and so I, again, I, I'm not gonna read all of this to you. Um, I, hopefully it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, what you will see is a, what, we, what we found to be the key metrics, um, a definition of those, and then a description of how you can estimate or calculate that. Uh, I should say a word about terminology here. People have their own terminology for their own metrics in their programs, which is why we provide you with a definition of what we are talking about here. Um, and so, you know, take your terminology and apply it to these particular metrics. Um, so the first three here are you need to know the number of intakes, you need to know the number of investigations, 
and you need to know the average number of hours per investigation. And that can be a math problem that you can use. You can try to figure out what it should be, uh, perhaps from using that workflow model. But that's these are the three metrics that you start with with this. Next slide, please. Um, and then you go on from there, and it becomes a bit of a math problem. And in the um, worksheet on the on the Excel spreadsheet, the nice thing is the Excel spreadsheet does the math for you on the tool. Uh, projected number of investigation hours, how many hours are you spending on each investigation? Uh, how much work are you getting out of each FTE per year? You should be able to figure that out uh, with the help of your, of your, perhaps of your HR office. And then it becomes, like I said, a math problem. You're able to project the number of needed casework FTEs and the ultimately the casework per worker. Next slide, please. Um, and so you end up, once you've done this projection, you can figure out the number, you need to know the number. And so once you know how many workers you think you need, you look at how many workers that you currently have authorized, you take the difference, you factor in a vacancy rate um, and, you, and you come up with how many FTEs that you need beyond what you currently have. Out of that, you can also calculate the number of management and support staff that you need. So let's look at this a little bit more detailed instead of just the definition. So it's a three-step process. Um, and you went once, next slide, please. So it's a three-step process. Um, you want to use that worksheet that I talked about um, to calculate the number of needed FTEs in a year. Then you, kept, then you factor in the vacancy rate. And then the third step is to figure out the additional support staff that you might need. So for the first step, next slide, um, you are... Uh, calculating the number of needed FTEs in a year. And we outline step by step the way that you do that. You estimate the number of investigations, you estimate the number of hours it takes to do those investigations, you calculate how many FTEs uh, you have based on that number of hours, and um, you can do that for all of your different categories of staff. And then in the second step is you want to think about, next slide, uh, your vacancy rate. And so you're going to need to work with your HR off office uh, to factor in a vacancy rate um, and calculate ultimately how many FTEs that you need. And then when you take the difference between how many you need and how many you have, you're able to project uh, what your unmet need is for FTEs. And then the third thing is, is the next slide, is to think about uh, okay, so I have figured out how many frontline staff I need. What impact does that have on my need for other types of staff? And some programs um, use a ratio to be able to do that. So for, for every five FTEs, every five caseworkers, they know they need one more supervisor. For every 100 FTEs, they know they need another quality assurance worker and so on. And so we provide you a way to calculate uh, those additional needed support staff that you may have in the program. So that's the second objective here, is projecting the number of needed staff. Next slide, please. The third area here is to project, um, is not to project, but is to figure out, okay, okay, I understand my workflow, I've projected the number of staff that I have, but how am I going to be able to manage all this? And so what we're trying to do here is to provide some concepts and metrics for managing, assessing, monitoring, adjusting the workload of your caseload staff. Uh, you need to manage workload if you're going to achieve positive outcomes for your client and your staff, as we were discussing earlier. Um, a couple of key considerations here. Um, the first one is that uh, that whole process of projecting the number of needed FTEs is reliant upon being able to look at some of the metrics that we're going to go over in this managed workload section. Um, and the second key concept is that no one metric is sufficient. This is the point I made earlier 
about caseload. Um, in the programs that we talked to, they were using a dashboard type of approach to manage their workload. They were able to look at all of these metrics aligned with one another and with them, they're able to get a complete picture of what is going on with their workload. So let's run through what some of these are. Next slide, please. Um, so these are some of the key variables to manage your workload. Overall, the two big ones that, that we looked at were workflow balance and average caseload. Yes, APS programs were using average caseload to look at and understand their overall workload. It's an important metric to look at to compare over time to know what the changes are. It's an important metric to look at to compare different levels of the organization, different organizational units uh, to understand if workload is in balance across different geographic areas, across different units or to see if some programs are doing a much better job than other, some parts of the program are doing a much better job than other parts of the program in managing uh, their workload. So caseload's a key metric, but caseload, I'll say for the third time, can be manipulated. Uh, so some of the other programs were also looking at something that, that I ended up labeling workflow balance. And that is we are trying to look carefully at the, at the balance of cases coming in compared to cases going out over time, inflow and outflow. You want your inflow and your outflow um, to be in balance over time. And so that's another overall way of looking at your workload. Next slide, please. So we also tried to take a look at, and I, Leslie, I think you skipped the slide. Can you go back to intake? I apologize, Carl. I do not know which slide I'm on. Hmm? This is not it. I'm sorry. I've No, you seem to skip uh, a couple of slides. There we go, one more back. Yeah, I'm sorry. I go. apologize. Uh, no problem. Intake. So uh, as you're managing your workload, you got to start off by understanding what is coming into the program. And so you see a number of metrics listed here um, for this. And kind of the overarching question that you want to think about, and this was something, again, the programs emphasized to us, is your pre-screening process working appropriately? Because if you're not at intake screening out cases that are not appropriate for APS, then you're adding workload onto your staff that is not necessary. So if, if you look at this set of measures together, you, you hopefully will get a pretty good idea, at least some indirect indication of whether you, your intake function is working as well as um, it should. So next slide. Um, another variable that you have to think about very carefully, as we have mentioned several times, is how long does it take to investigate a case and keep a case open, and, and how does that break down? And so you see case initiation time, you see the average length of the investigation, you see in the language we came up for it, the next section, average length of intervention activities, that's how long are you spending on the services phase of the investigation? If, if you separate it that way, you get to an overall length of the case and then you get average case documentation time. So those three in the middle kind of, kind of obviously make sense. How long is the investigation? How long are we providing services? How long is the overall case? When we talk to the programs, and I keep emphasizing this, this is where this came from, they said the faster you investigate, the faster you initiate cases, the much better job you're going to do managing your workload. Case initiation is really a critical metric in this. And then the last one in terms of average case documentation time is not maybe self-obvious, uh, but those programs emphasize the fact that the faster you do documentation, the better handle you're going to have on your overall 
workload. So next slide. So thinking about it from a macro perspective, um, what are the overall um, workload indicators that you want to think about? And, and this is an area where maybe there's not been as much um, advancement in the APS. Uh, so what, what's the amount of case activities in the case? Uh, one of the county programs that we looked at was actually trying to count case activities in the case. How many interviews did they do? Choose whatever case activities you want to choose. Uh, and they were trying to understand the relationship of those case activities to how much time it took to do a case to the outcomes in a particular case. So counting case activities is one thing that you can think about if you've got the case management system that allows you to do that. What is your pending rate? Uh, and this becomes um, a, a, a critical thing for programs to think about beyond caseload. How many cases are pending at any one particular time? And you can um, measure this at the worker level, at the unit level, at the state level. Um, and, and you can see that parenthetical open to a better term here. Uh, pending rate was the, was the term that we used in Texas. Uh, that, that sometimes is understood by people, sometimes isn't understood by people, but it's how many cases at any one point in time um, are open because if you get above a certain level, you're going to end up with backlogs. You really need to closely monitor that. Another factor that a couple of programs were looking at was how much time since the last activity in a case. Are you, do you have cases that are just sitting? If you're able to measure this, then you're going to keep a pretty good handle on on workload if you're if you're tracking this um, and another thing to look at is the percent of cases by maltreatment type you have to acknowledge that certain types of cases require more activity and work than others and so you want to be looking at what's the balance uh, between the different types of maltreatment that a particular worker may have next slide please um, uh, workload indicators so these are just some some workload indicators specific to FTEs. And, and one of the things that we discovered from talking to programs is they don't count all FTEs the same, depending on A, their experience, and more particularly, where are they in the training process. So they would even in their caseload calculations uh, not use the whole number one, but would use a partial number uh, for the number of FTEs that they have when they're trying to calculate caseload to get a more accurate representation based on the fact that some workers are going to be able to handle more cases than others are due to training primarily. Uh, it is really important to know and understand the capacity of your workforce. And so when you look particularly at these first two measures here, um, that helps as a way of measuring that and understanding that over time. And then turnover rate, um, you know, we, we briefly touched on recruit, the importance of recruitment and retention earlier. You have to be looking at your turnover rate uh, that for obvious reasons has a direct impact on your worker capacity and your ability to investigate cases. So next slide, please. Um, and then in the end, we tried to put together some metrics to say, okay, overall, what is that impact on, on outcomes? And so these are fairly typical metrics that you see used by APS programs. Um, what is your substantiation rate? What's your, by finding type, what's your disposition rate? How many, what percent of cases are you substantiating? What percent is unsubstantiated? Um, uh, if you're one of those cases that has an unknown or indetermined kind of category, track that over time and see if it is changing. Um, what are supervisors saying about case? What's the percentage of your cases that are rejected for approval when they go up to the supervisor? Track that over time. Uh, what percent of your clients are receiving services? Track that over time. What's the rate of recurrence? over time or in com comparing one unit to another. All of these, if you track them over time or make comparisons across organizational 
units give you an indication of what impact is workload having on my particular program. Workload is not the only thing that impacts these, but all of these can give you an indication of what is going on with your workload. So, next slide. A couple of additional considerations, uh, and this is just sort of in summary. Um, I will emphasize again that this is a workload tool that is meant to try to help the diversity of APS programs. That means that um, terminology, the specific program activities are going to vary from program to program and you need to be able to modify it uh, for your individual use. Um, metrics will help you manage your program but you need to have good program data management tools to do that. You need to get to the place where you have a dashboard. Ideally, you need to get to the place where you have a dashboard that is in real time. You need to have a case management system that's going to give you information uh, to be able to measure all of these things. It, this is all good in the abstract, it needs to be real in the day-to-day -day management of your program, and that means you need to incorporate it into your program data management tools. Um, using data to manage is necessary, but you gotta be very careful with it. Uh, you wanna do it in such a way that your program encourages constructive and positive use of data. You don't want staff saying, and y'all have heard me say this before, all management cares about is the numbers. No, management doesn't care about the numbers, but the numbers help us to understand what your needs and what your burdens are as staff. And so it's that culture of how you use the data becomes uh, really important. And so Ultimately, good management is not just a uh, performance, but you need to think about impacts on policy, impacts on practice, process, and most importantly, on the people uh, in your particular program. And then the final thing I would say is that um, I hope the tool and the toolkit is self-explanatory and easy to use as it possibly can be. Uh, but I am sure you will have questions and we will be glad to help you with any questions that you may have on it going forward. And I left a little bit of time for questions here at the end. I want to thank again everybody that has helped us with this nationally, Ohio, Texas, the programs that you see listed on the right side, evident change. Um, I this this if it has not been evident was a uh, a field informed process to develop these things and their help and assistance has been much appreciated and with that I will be oh next steps um, so we're gonna as soon as ACL approves it we're gonna disseminate the tool and the toolkit we'll get it up on our website we're gonna do a final report to ACL which you may also find helpful. We're gonna do some version of this workshop at the NAPSA conference. And as I said a second ago, we'll be available to provide any technical assistance that you may need on it um, going forward. And with that, I will be glad to answer any questions in the little bit of time we have remaining. Well, Carl, I do have one question for you. And this goes all the way back to your discussion about um, estimating the workload time activities. The question is, are there any tools or guidance available to assist in estimating the time for completing the different case activities? This goes back to where you estimated, I think, 1.5 hours for completing an assessment and documenting it. So the one of the purposes of the workload of the workflow process tool of this is to be able to help you to do that. Um, you you can sit down with your staff and you can disaggregate the steps and the activities in a workflow and you can use them to help you do that. There are, there are time management studies that can be done. Um, th their utility varies 
Um, their cost varies, but there are those time management study tools that can be done. Some of you may be doing something like that already for Medicaid claiming, um, but there are ways to do that. I won't, I won't profess to be an expert on that, but that is something that we could follow up and help with probably. And I do know that that is something that the evident change folks have done to help in the CPS world. Okay, well, that was actually the only question. Everything else I have has been a comment. Um, people are looking forward to seeing the tool when it comes out. And then you also have a kudos. So, <laughs> a very well done webinar. So with that, I am going to say to people, feel free to reach out to the APS TARC with any questions. Here's the website, our email address, and you can reach out to Carl directly using his email here on this slide. Okay, it's not showing. There, there it is. Now it's showing. Sorry about that. I'm having a little bit of difficulty with that today, apparently. And with that, I want to thank everyone for your time and attention, and um, we will see you with our next webinar. Take care. Thank you.